I just want to make it clear that I've never had intentions of taking my twin sister's life. And if I could, uh, if I could take back what I could, I could in a heartbeat. On January 8th, 1992, an extraordinary event took place in the city of Camden. New Jersey identical twin girls Amanda and Anna Ramirez were born into the world. The girls arrived just minutes apart, like two little angels entering this life hand in hand. From their very first days, the sisters shared a special bond that only grew stronger over the years. When I first heard about this case, I was struck by the fact that Amanda and Anna were so close from birth. In my years working as a detective, I've seen many different families, but such a powerful twinship is truly unique. Although I didn't personally investigate this case, I feel compelled to share it with you because it deserves your attention. I want you to draw your own conclusions from this truly shocking story. I hope you have your popcorn ready because you're in for quite a tale. The girl's parents, immigrants from Puerto Rico, had built a large, loving family in pursuit of a better life. Despite the hardships they faced on their journey to the American dream, they managed to keep their home warm and united. Amanda and Anna grew up surrounded by older siblings, with younger sisters arriving later. Yet the twins stood out from the rest with their uncanny resemblance and inseparable bond. From a very young age, the sisters were like two peas in a pod. They adored dressing alike, playing with identical toys, and spending every waking moment together. It seemed Amanda and Anna understood each other without words, sensing the other's moods and emotions. Even childhood squabbles were quickly forgotten as they became best friends again. I've seen photos of Amanda and Anna as children, and I must say, their likeness is simply astonishing. It must have been challenging even for their parents to tell them apart at times. That closeness between sisters is unique, but it also had the potential to cause issues down the road. Watching Amanda and Anna during those years, one could only marvel at the strength of their connection. They were like two shoots of the same tree, reaching for each other, drawing strength and inspiration. Their parents and family took immense pride in their special girls and rejoiced that in this big, often harsh world, they had each other. Little did anyone know then what trials lay ahead and how their unique bond would impact the course of events. But in those carefree childhood days, everything seemed so simple and bright, with so many uncharted paths still to explore. The birth of twins is always something special, but Amanda and Anna's story is truly one of a kind. Their loving, close-knit upbringing built a strong foundation for their future lives. However, as we know, life often throws unexpected curvy balls. And this case is a prime example of how even the strongest bonds can be tested by fate. How so, you ask? Well, I'll tell you, but only to those wonderful people who are subscribed to my channel. If you're not subscribed yet, be sure to hit that button like this video and leave any comment to help more people find it. From the very first days, Amanda and Anna's parents noticed their daughter's incredible bond that seemed to have formed in the womb itself. They recounted how in those early months, the sisters would even sleep in the same crib as though unable to be apart. This special connection only intensified over the years, forging Amanda and Anna into a true team. They did everything together, practically joined at the hip, unwaveringly following each other's every move. Observing them, I couldn't help but ponder just how powerful a twin bond can become and how it shapes their lives. The girl's mother, Mrs. Ramirez, warmly recalled how she nurtured the friendship between her daughters, wanting Amanda and Anna to forever remain each other's pillars, and the sisters did not disappoint. They learned to walk together, started preschool and school together, shared their most intimate secrets. It seemed nothing in this world could break their mighty sisterly union that only tempered with time. As a detective, I often encounter cases where close bonds between people become a trial for themselves and those around them. So Amanda and Anna's story piqued my interest, not just professionally, but also in understanding human nature. The parents shared that the twins had their own secret language for communicating with each other. At times, it was as if they could read each other's minds, anticipating the other's actions and desires. It was something unfathomable like a telepathic link that existed only between the two of them. Even at school, teachers marveled at how Amanda and Anna could seamlessly complete each other's answers as one singular entity. This extraordinary sisterly bond inspired awe, but also raised concerns. Would it hinder their individual growth? Could the girls find their place in life alone, without their counterparts' constant presence? These were the questions that nagged not just the parents, but me as well as I delved into the details of this incredible story. Yet in childhood, it all seemed so idyllic. Amanda and Anna were blissfully happy together, and it appeared it would always be that way. They shared their most private dreams, supported each other's pursuits, rejoiced in successes and consoled failures. The sisters were two halves of a whole, unable to envision life without the other. 
Amanda and Anna grew up in an atmosphere of love, support, and unity. The large Ramirez family did everything in their power to provide the girls with a joyful, carefree childhood. The sisters played together, got into mischief together, attended family celebrations side by side. They adored dressing up in matching dresses and fooling those around them by pretending to be each other. Their parents smiled recounting those moments when even they couldn't tell their own daughters apart. It was a true test for everyone, but also a source of laughter and delight in the Ramirez household. At school, the twin sisters stuck together too. They excelled equally in nearly every subject, often doing each other's homework assignments. Yet teachers didn't scold Amanda and Anna too harshly for such antics, as the sisters demonstrated excellent grades and behavior. According to their school friends, Amanda and Anna operated as a team, always ready to help one another out. Even during tests, the sisters managed to discreetly pass notes with answers. It was something incredible, as if they could read each other's minds. The twins grew into kind-hearted, good-natured and joyful young women. They easily connected with people and lit up any group. Amanda and Anna dreamed of becoming nurses to help the sick and ailing. And though their family lacked the funds for both daughters' education, their parents vowed to do whatever it took to make their girls' dreams come true. With tears in her eyes, Mrs. Ru Ramirez recounted how she and her husband worked tirelessly to give Amanda and Anna the chance to attend college. It was their shared dream, and they were willing to make any sacrifice for their children's happiness. Amanda and Anna's classmates and friends always remarked on their kindness, sincerity and willingness to lend a hand. The girls were the true jewels of school life, ever smiling, welcoming and open to connection. They enthusiastically participated in all kinds of events, from charity fairs to school plays. It seemed nothing could cast a shadow over their happy childhood and carefree adolescence. Yet life brings not just joys and triumphs, but obstacles too that must be overcome. For Amanda and Anna, the trial came in the form of their father's illness. Mr. Ramirez fell gravely sick, leaving the family in dire straits. But even in those dark times, the sisters never lost hope, supporting each other every step. They banded together even tighter, striving to help their mother and ease their father's suffering. This period became a true test of their spiritual fortitude and sisterly bonds resilience. But that carefree childhood passed quickly, and the sisters had to grow up. Anna was the first to marry her beloved Louis and give birth to three wonderful children. She became a doting mother who spared no effort for her little ones. At the same time, Anna completed nursing courses and began working as a licensed nurse. Patients and colleagues adored Anna for her kindness, warmth and willingness to help at a moment's notice. As her co-workers recounted, Anna was a true angel in the hospital, always smiling, compassionate and tireless. She had a knack for lifting every patient's spirits, finding the right words of solace and support. Anna worked hard to secure a bright future for her kids. Yet despite her busyness, she always made time for her large family, especially her beloved sister Amanda. Anna often visited her parents, sisters and brothers, chatting with Amanda nearly every day the girls would talk for hours on the phone, sharing experiences and supporting each other. Even distance and life's troubles couldn't weaken their special bond. It seemed to only grow stronger over the years, helping the sisters overcome any hardship. Unlike her sister, Amanda was in no rush to marry. She too completed nursing courses and began working at the same hospital as Anna. The girls were together again like in childhood, now saving lives side by side. Colleagues joked that with nurses like the Ramirez sisters, any patient would recover in no time, as they were a true guardian angel team. Like Anna, Amanda was always ready to lend a hand, uplift with a kind word and sincere smile. Patients adored her warmth and compassion, while colleagues respected her professionalism and dedication. In her free time, Amanda often visited her sister to play with her nieces and nephews and catch up with Anna. The sisters could spend hours in the kitchen over cups of coffee, reminiscing about childhood and discussing their girlhood dreams. They laughed until they cried, recounting hilarious tales from the past, and cried sharing each other's pains and disappointments. These moments of sisterly closeness were the most precious for them, for it was in those instances that they truly felt happy and needed by one another. Amanda too dreamed of getting married and having children, so she actively helped Anna care for her babies, gaining first-hand experience in motherhood. The first years of Anna's eldest daughter's life unfolded under the watchful eyes of her loving mother and doting Aunt Amanda. This allowed the sisters to bond even tighter and preserve their special connection. And for Amanda, caring for her niece became an invaluable school for future parenthood. She joyfully played with, fed, bathed, and doted on the little one. Anna joked that with such a great helper, she could have 10 kids. 
and Anna herself was in dire need of her twins' assistance juggling three young children plus work, the young mother could barely keep up with all her duties. Amanda tried to be there, offering her shoulder in the toughest moments. She visited her sister every weekend, helped with cleaning, cooked delicious meals so Anna could get some rest. The sisters strolled through parks with the kids, went shopping, discussed their girly secrets. These were moments of true happiness and unity when it seemed the whole world revolved around their small yet mighty family. Eventually, Amanda got a boyfriend and unexpectedly became pregnant. It was a real surprise for both sisters, but they knew they'd tackle any challenge together. Now it was Anna's turn to fully support her sister, sharing wisdom and advice. The girls jointly prepared for the arrival of their parents' first grandchild and Amanda's firstborn. They spent hours picking out baby items, setting up the nursery, dreaming of what he would be like. Amanda's pregnancy was not an easy one, with severe morning sickness and swelling. But Anna was always by her side, ready to help and encourage her sister. She drove Amanda to all her medical checkups, monitored her well-being, ensured she ate properly and didn't overexert herself. Anna understood how crucial it was for Amanda to feel protected and needed during this difficult time. And then that long-awaited day finally arrived little Alex, Amanda's firstborn and Anna's nephew, entered the world. The sisters couldn't get enough of the tiny bundle who resembled them both so much. Together they cared for, bathed and lulled the baby to sleep. Alex became yet another proof of their inseparable bond, one more thread tying their fates tightly together. Motherhood transformed Amanda, making her more responsible and wise. Now she understood her sister's anxieties and joys even better. The girls could spend hours discussing childhood antics, exchanging parenting tips, dreaming of their kids' futures. They knew their children would grow up just as close and loving as they were. Over the years, the children grew while Amanda and Anna's sisterly bond only strengthened further. They continued to be each other's pillars, sharing every joy and sorrow. Their kids too grew up together like siblings, inheriting their mother's love and devotion to family. Despite the demands of motherhood, the sisters still found time to cut loose. Amanda and Anna loved partying and living it up with friends. They often hit the clubs together, dancing until dawn. Among their crew, the twins radiated wild energy, positivity, and some magical aura of unity. The Ramirez sisters seemed to read each other's minds, understanding every half-uttered word, laughing at inside jokes only they shared. On June 22, 2019, Amanda and Anna went out partying again. At that point, they were 27, with Anna raising three young kids while Amanda had recently given birth to her first daughter and was battling postpartum depression. But despite the exhaustion and responsibilities, the sisters decided to let loose and dance like old times. The girls first had fun at a club with friends. Around midnight, the group headed to their cousin's place. There, the sisters continued drinking, laughing and snapping carefree selfies. In one photo posted to social media around 5 a.m., the beaming twins posed with drinks in hand, the caption reading they were feeling those positive vibrations. Little did anyone know then that this picture would become the sisters' final living image. As the detective who investigated this case, I understand how precious every moment spent with loved ones truly is. That photo became a symbol of just how fragile human life can be and how crucial it is to savor every instant while we can. In that snapshot, Amanda and Anna looked carefree and joyful, blissfully unaware of the tragedy looming just ahead. Around 5.30 a.m., tragedy struck. It was at that moment that Anna suffered a deep stab wound to her chest and collapsed bleeding onto the sidewalk outside her cousin's home. The police received a frantic 911 call around 5.40 a.m. from Amanda. The terrified woman pleaded for help, screaming that her sister was injured and bleeding profusely. Before medics and cops arrived, Anna was still breathing but soon lost consciousness from the trauma and blood loss. An ambulance rushed the victim to the nearest medical center. Doctors fought for nearly an hour to save Anna's life, but at 6.20 a.m. they pronounced her dead. The severe stab wound proved fatal the mother of three had perished in the arms of medical staff. This tragic event came as a true shock to the Ramirez family and all who knew Anna. The horrific news of her death spread like wildfire through the small town, leaving a trail of unanswered questions in its wake. No one could believe that this joyful, loving woman had left this world so young under such mysterious circumstances. For Amanda, losing her sister was the hardest blow of all. In an instant, she lost her closest kin whom she'd walked through life side by side with. The pain of this loss was unbearable, the realization that Anna was gone for good seeming like a waking nightmare to escape from. But the harsh reality was that Anna had truly passed, forever changing the lives of her loved ones. 
Now, the Ramirez family would have to find a way to keep living without her, raise her children, remember her with love and sorrow, and Amanda would have to grow accustomed to never being able to hug her sister, seek her advice, or simply sit in silent sisterly company again. Anna's death left a whirlwind of questions unanswered. What had happened that fateful night? Who could have wished harm upon this kind-hearted woman? Was it an accident or intentional crime? The answers still needed to be found, and that became the primary mission for the police and detectives investigating the case. But whatever the official findings, for Anna's loved ones, she would forever remain a loving daughter, sister, mother and friend. Her bright spirit would live on in their hearts, her memory providing warmth in the darkest hours. The shocking news of Anna's death left the entire Ramirez family stunned. No one could believe that some madman had inflicted a fatal wound upon the young mother in the middle of the street. After all, Anna was a kind, compassionate girl with no enemies or ill wishes, no run-ins with the law. So who could have dealt with a nurse so brutally? A blind coincidence or someone from her inner circle? Amanda's behavior immediately raised many questions for the police. Her clothing was covered in stains of her dead sister's blood, while her hands bore fresh cuts characteristic of a struggle over a knife. Moreover, neighbors claimed to have heard a loud argument between the sisters, but no male voices. These details compelled investigators to pay special attention to Amanda and her possible involvement in the tragedy. At first, Amanda refused to let the officers into her cousin's apartment, insisting she had just accidentally cut herself. But the bloody footprints on the floor and blood-stained kitchen knife in the sink made detectives suspect a complex case of family violence. The woman was taken in for questioning, where she would have to explain her behavior and recount everything that happened that fateful night. During interrogation, Amanda acted strangely and ambiguously. She oscillated between crying and pleading for belief in her innocence, then abruptly shutting down and refusing to answer questions. She claimed not to remember many details due to alcohol intoxication, that she and her sister had argued over something trivial, followed by a blackout. Such testimony only strengthened investigators' suspicions about Amanda's role in the murder. Other party guests confirmed the sisters had indeed quarreled before Anna stormed out alone. But no one could say precisely what happened next and how she sustained her fatal injury. Forensics showed the knife used to kill the woman belonged to the owners of the apartment where the party took place. However, no fingerprints were found and the sister's cousin swore he wasn't involved in the crime. This tangled case became a true challenge for detectives. On one hand, all evidence pointed to Anna's killer being someone in her inner circle, possibly even her own sister. But on the other, the motive for such a brutal crime remained unclear. After all, the Ramirez sisters had always been renowned for their inseparability and genuine love for each other. Who and why would want to shatter that special bond? As the investigation dragged on, the Ramirez family tried to recover from the horrific tragedy. They couldn't fathom Amanda intentionally harming her own flesh and blood, offering her unconditional support. But lingering doubts and unanswered questions tormented them. Why was Amanda acting so strangely? What really transpired that night? And would they ever uncover the truth about Anna's death? These questions haunted Anna's loved ones and friends. They understood the answers could prove too painful and shocking. Yet they also knew without the truth, they couldn't truly move forward, couldn't properly bid Anna farewell and find solace. Initially, Amanda tried convincing the police she had simply found her already injured sister on the sidewalk. She claimed to have approached Anna, attempted to stop the bleeding, and gotten covered in blood herself in the process. Then scared, she ran to the apartment to await the ambulance. But this version poorly aligned with the defensive cuts on Amanda's hands that immediately raised investigators' suspicions she was hiding something. They began scrutinizing her testimony more thoroughly. The woman quickly realized she wasn't being believed and changed her story. Now she insisted that she and Anna had been drinking at their cousin's place when they abruptly got into an argument, even resulting in Anna slapping her. Afterwards, Anna left for home while Amanda stayed behind with their cousin. 45 minutes later, she went outside and discovered her sister's bloodied body. This account seemed more plausible yet still left many questions unanswered. Investigators tried determining what exactly the sisters had quarreled over and whether it could have motivated a murder. But Amanda kept altering her statements, getting muddled in the details, unable to clearly explain what happened. At times she claimed not remembering the conflict's cause, then suddenly recalling minor insults that supposedly escalated into a physical fight. Such inconsistent, contradictory testimony only deepened detectives' suspicions about Amanda's involvement in the crime. They suspected she was concealing something, perhaps trying to cover for herself or someone else. But proving it was no easy feat with no direct evidence against Amanda, while her statements continually changed. 
Interviewing other witnesses didn't clarify matters either. The sister's cousin corroborated they had fought but insisted hearing and seeing nothing suspicious. Neighbors reported loud shouts and scuffling noises, but none could pinpoint precisely who exited the building and when. Investigators found themselves at a dead end. All signs pointed to a crime of passion, yet the motive and circumstances remained baffling, and Amanda's convoluted statements only further muddied the waters. Meanwhile, the Ramirez family grieved their terrible tragedy. They couldn't fathom Anna being gone, desperately searching for answers. Parents and relatives tried supporting Amanda, believing her innocence, yet tortured by lingering doubts. Why was she acting so strangely? What really happened that night? And would they ever uncover the truth? For Amanda, the situation became a true ordeal. She had to live daily with the burden of guilt and suspicion, respond to uncomfortable questions from detectives and kin, reliving that horrific moment she claimed to have discovered her sister's body again and again. And though the woman maintained her non-involvement, her own memories and feelings grew increasingly tangled, tormenting her every waking moment. Would Amanda be able to prove her innocence? Could the investigation unravel this complex knot of contradictory testimonies and find the real killer? And what price would the Ramirez family have to pay for the truth about Anna's death? Amanda claimed not to remember the reasons for arguing with her sister she had drunk too much that night. She then recounted how after being slapped, something seemed to short circuit in her head. She blacked out, only coming to while standing over bloodied Anna with a knife in hand. Terrified, she tossed the knife in the sink and called an ambulance. The woman wept bitterly, begging to be believed that she hadn't wanted her little sister dead. Her testimony rang sincere yet raised many questions and doubts for investigators. Detectives concluded Amanda was holding something back. It was doubtful a simple quarrel after 27 years of an ideal sisterly bond could escalate into such a bloody attack. Those mysterious lapses in memory also raised major skepticism. Police suspected Amanda had long harbored resentment towards her sister that came bursting out in a drunken rage with a knife. They began carefully examining the sister's past, searching for possible triggers for conflict. The fact that the woman had struck Anna with one precise blow to the heart indicated premeditated intent to kill, and her attempt to shift blame onto some abstract assailant only worsened the situation. The family denied any serious conflicts between the sisters. Their cousin corroborated the fight, but admitted not knowing what had provoked the argument between the twins. Without this key information, investigators knew unraveling the truth would prove difficult. The defensive cuts on Amanda's hands seemed to confirm her account of struggling over the knife. But if events unfolded as she claimed, why brandish a deadly weapon during a tiff with her sister in the first place? And why not immediately call an ambulance instead of returning to the apartment? These lingering questions tormented detectives striving to reconstruct the night's fateful events. Amanda couldn't answer those questions. She insisted remembering precious little from that evening, too intoxicated and ravaged by postpartum depression. But despite her tears and pleas for belief, police remained convinced something horrific had transpired between the sisters that morning Amanda wasn't divulging. Whatever it was had culminated in one sister's death with a knife in the other's grip, and now investigators had to determine whether it was tragic accident or premeditated murder. As the probe dragged on, the Ramirez family struggled to find solace and understand what had befallen their girls. They couldn't fathom Amanda intentionally harming the sister she'd been inseparable from her whole life. Yet gnawing doubts and speculations tormented them. Was Amanda concealing some terrible secret? Had that secret ignited the fatal fight? And would they ever know the truth? Meanwhile, Amanda herself, broken by grief and despair, strove to prove her innocence. She replayed that night's events in her mind over and over, but memories remained jumbled and fragmented. The woman couldn't comprehend how she could have caused her beloved sister's death, even accidentally, and the blackouts only compounded her confusion and fear. Could she truly be repressing something unaware herself? Police continued gathering evidence and interviewing witnesses, hoping to find the key to unraveling this chilling tale. They understood any detail could prove pivotal, any testimony could shed light on that fateful night. Yet the more they uncovered, the more tangled the case became, and the harder it was to believe Amanda could have intentionally taken her twin sister's life. This tragedy became an ordeal not just for the Ramirez family, but for all who knew Amanda and Anna. People struggled to comprehend how such a loving, close-knit clan could find themselves at the epicenter of such a horrific story, and the suspicions and rumors only salted the already raw wounds. The media pounced on the news, further complicating detectives' work. As a practicing detective myself, I understand the immense pressure public scrutiny exerts, making it even harder to focus on the job at hand. 
The investigation had reached a dead end when suddenly an anonymous call came through to the police hotline. The unknown caller claimed Anna had been murdered by her own sister out of jealousy. This version was later corroborated by the victim's aunt, who alleged Amanda had been secretly carrying on an affair with Anna's husband, exploiting her uncanny resemblance to her twin. When Anna uncovered this liaison, she apparently accused her sister of treacherous betrayal in a heated rage. This bombshell information became a true sensation, compelling detectives to view the case from a new angle. The aunt insisted she had overheard Amanda boasting to a friend about her adulterous tryst with Anna's husband, mockingly adding how her dimwit sister remained oblivious. This theory could explain Amanda's strange behavior adamantly denying the fight's trigger. If the woman had indeed seduced her brother-in-law, she likely wouldn't want to admit to such a shameful act. Investigators began scrutinizing interpersonal dynamics within the Ramirez family more closely, seeking confirmation of this scandalous hypothesis. However, all other relatives, friends and especially Anna's husband unanimously dismissed rumors of a love triangle. They maintained the twins loved each other above all else, while Anna adored her Louis and would never have betrayed him. Suspicions of infidelity struck the kin as absurd and outrageous, completely inconsistent with the deceased's bright image. They couldn't fathom Amanda so treacherously deceiving her lifelong inseparable sister. Amanda and Anna's 19-year-old younger sister Monica swore under oath that the twins simply couldn't have betrayed one another that way, bound by a profound spiritual connection. The girl testified that Anna had been dating Louis for years, while Amanda had her own longtime boyfriend whom she had a daughter with and planned to marry. So there was no incentive for an affair with her brother-in-law, Monica insisted. Her testimony cast doubt on the love triangle theory, compelling a search for alternative motives. When police notified Amanda of her sister's death, she allegedly flew into hysterics. According to Monica, who was on the phone with Amanda in that moment, her sister wept so inconsolably and begged for belief that her tears clearly stemmed from genuine anguish rather than a treacherous deceiver's feigned remorse. The family continued maintaining the police investigation files amounted to unfounded speculation and slander. They couldn't accept Amanda being capable of such a horrific crime. Investigators found themselves in a difficult position. On one hand, the jealousy-fueled love triangle seemed plausible, potentially explaining Amanda's bizarre conduct. But on the other, testimony from the sisters' loved ones directly contradicted this narrative. Plus, no hard evidence of an affair could be uncovered. An anonymous call and the aunt's hearsay provided far too flimsy a basis for premeditated murder charges. In my opinion, this love triangle is pure nonsense, pardon my bluntness. But if you have your own theory, feel free to share it with me in the comments, I'd be happy to discuss it further. Meanwhile, Amanda's defense insisted on her innocence. Her attorneys argued all evidence against their client amounted to circumstantial contradictions. They urged the court not to fall for provocations and conjecture, but rely solely on facts and common sense. The defenders stressed that Amanda and Anna were not just sisters, but best friends who would never betray each other. The case garnered increasing publicity, drawing intense public and media scrutiny. Public opinion diverged some believed in Amanda's innocence and sympathized with the Ramirez family's plight, while others remained convinced of her guilt demanding harsh punishment. This trial became a true ordeal for all participants, especially Amanda fighting not just for her freedom, but to preserve her sister's honor and good name. In September 2019, Amanda entered into a plea deal with prosecutors. She admitted that under the influence of alcohol and postpartum depression, she had unconsciously, in a state of passion, stabbed her sister with a knife. The woman insisted she harbored no malicious intent and bitterly regretted her actions, having essentially ruined two lives her own and her beloved sister's. Her confession came as a shock to all who had followed this high-profile case. During the trial, Amanda wept bitterly begging God and everyone present for forgiveness, calling herself the vilest creature while pleading for a chance to atone. She stated she would now carry the cross of remorse and the pain of irreparable loss until the end of her days. The court's sentence paled in comparison to the eternal pangs of conscience she claimed. Her words moved those in the courtroom, yet could not bring the deceased Anna back. The judge ruled Anna's killing an intentional crime, but took into account Amanda's sincere remorse and extenuating circumstances. She was sentenced to six years imprisonment with possibility of parole after serving five years. Amanda broke down sobbing upon hearing the sentence, imploring the heavens and all around to forgive her most grievous sin. She understood this punishment amounted to only a fraction of the guilt she would bear for life. After the trial, the victim's relatives stated they harbored no ill will towards Amanda and accepted her remorse. Amanda and Anna's mother took custody of her grandchildren, 
while the rest of the family vowed to support the imprisoned woman's young daughter until her release. The kin believed Amanda had sincerely repented and deserved a chance at atonement. They held faith that in time they could forgive her and restore family ties for the children's sake and Anna's memory. Such a chilling story, colleagues. As difficult as it is to admit, it was drinking and unbridled emotion that ruined the lives of two young women, two families depriving five children of a mother's love, and the core mystery what truly sparked that fatal burst of rage continues to be debated by police, attorneys, journalists to this day. The official investigation failed to provide a definitive answer. Amanda's loved ones view her an innocent victim of tragic circumstance, while law enforcement leans towards a theory of premeditated murder driven by jealousy. Proving or disproving a clandestine liaison between Amanda and her brother-in-law is now impossible. The woman adamantly denies any such subtext to the fight, while Anna's husband categorically rejects even hypothetical possibility of such events transpiring. This secret, it seems, will be forever buried alongside Anna. Yet despite all the speculation and uncomfortable questions, one sad fact alone remains certain a young mother of two infants ended her 27-year-old twin sister's life with a single knife blow and now bitterly regrets her actions. And the bereaved Ramirez family will take a long time recovering from the consequences of that dreadful night of June 22, 2019. They will have to learn to live with this pain and Anna's memory, raise her children and build a new life without her. Jazz, like or say something. I looked that way and all I saw was like blood all over the floor. She's not gonna come back. Come on, mama, mama. 4 30 p.m. Just another day for a police officer patrolling the streets in his car. Suddenly, a breathless 16 year old girl named Tasme Whitehead ran up to the vehicle. She was in a panic, screaming and trying to explain something to the officer. From her choppy words, the cop understood that the girl and her sister had returned home from school to find their mother murdered. This is Detective Brooks. You're on the DBS channel. Today, I'm going to share with you one of the bloodiest and most shocking cases on my channel, so be sure to watch until the end, that's where it gets really interesting. Although I didn't personally investigate this case, my colleagues from the investigations department shared the details with me, and I decided to tell it all to you. This story took place in the small town of Kinears, Georgia. The officer immediately called for backup and medical assistance at the scene of the tragedy. Arriving at the address Tasme provided, the police saw another girl near the house an exact copy of Tasme. As it turned out, they were twin sisters, Tasmia and Jasmia. The girls were in a state of shock from what they had seen. They were immediately given first aid, trying to calm and stabilize them. Meanwhile, a group of police officers entered the house to examine the crime scene. Right from the doorstep, their attention was drawn to a long bloody trail stretching from the door to the street. Judging by everything, the victim had tried to escape from the attacker, but he caught up with her and dragged her back into the house to finish his bloody deed. What the cops saw inside shocked even seasoned officers. On the floor, walls and even the ceiling were brown bloodstains evidence of a brutal massacre. It seemed as if someone had deliberately splattered blood all over the house. In my years of service, I've seen many crime scenes, but this picture was one of the most terrifying. The officers carefully examined the house room by room, searching for the victim's body and any evidence that could shed light on the identity of the killer. Eventually, in one of the rooms, they found what they were looking for the mutilated body of 33-year-old Nikki Whitehead, the mother of the twin girls. I can't help but note the diligence with which the killer tried to cover up the traces of his crime. The entire house was literally flooded with blood, but it was clear that someone had tried to clean up, albeit unsuccessfully. To completely cleanse the crime scene in such a short time was practically impossible. Later, Officer Chrisman, one of the first to arrive on the call, admitted that in his entire career, he had never seen such a bloody scene. This place made a depressing impression even on hardened cops. During the house search, the body of 33-year-old Nikki Whitehead, the mother of the twin girls, was found in one of the rooms. She was lying in the bathtub in a pool of her own blood. The woman had become a victim of a brutal attack her body was literally riddled with numerous stab wounds. Especially horrifying was the fact that the victim's spinal cord was practically severed. It seemed as if the killer had struck this area with particular fury. The expert who arrived at the crime scene counted about 80 stab wounds on the deceased's body. It's hard to even imagine the agony the poor woman endured before her death. It was also strange that the towels from the bathroom had disappeared somewhere. Later, they were found in the washing machine, soaked in blood. It looks like the killer tried to get rid of these pieces of evidence, but in a hurry, just shoved them into the machine. 
On the same day, a criminal case was opened under the murder article and an active search for the perpetrator began. The first to come under the scrutiny of the investigation were the victim's daughters Tasmia and Jasmia. During interrogation, the girls said that the house where they lived belonged to a man named Robert Head, with whom their mother had a relationship. But as it turned out, Robert was not Nikki's only admirer. The girls recalled overhearing their mother repeatedly talking on the phone with some Nikki Joe, especially when Head wasn't around. This fact interested the investigators and required further verification. Was Robert Head involved in the murder? What role did the mysterious Nikki Joe play? And most importantly, who actually committed this terrible act? Now I'm gonna tell you all about this in detail, but only for those wonderful and amazing people who subscribe to the channel right now like this video and leave any comment on it. Help me spread this story so people can draw conclusions from this shocking case. So during the interrogation of the victim Nikki Whitehead's daughters, new details of her personal life were revealed. Tasmia and Jasmia said that they had repeatedly heard their mother talking on the phone with some Nikki Joe, especially when her cohabitant Robert Head was not around. Interestingly, the girls themselves never saw Joe, including on the day of the tragedy. But the most intriguing fact was that on the eve of the murder, Nikki spoke again with this mysterious man, and then a serious quarrel broke up between them, after which the woman angrily slammed down the receiver. This detail immediately caught my attention as a detective. After all, it is quite possible that during that conversation, Nikki told her admirer about her desire to end their relationship, and such a decision could well become a motive for murder. How many times in my practice have I encountered similar situations a rejected lover commits a crime out of jealousy or resentment? Therefore, this version definitely needed to be checked. The police quickly found Nicky Joe and invited him for questioning. The man was genuinely surprised to learn the reason for the summons. He categorically denied his involvement in the murder and claimed that despite the one-sidedness of his feelings and the fact that Nicky kept him at a distance, he sincerely loved this woman and would never harm her. Joe confirmed that on the eve of the tragedy, he and Nikki really had a quarrel, but assured that it was a minor dispute over a misunderstanding, which was quickly settled. Moreover, according to him, for the entire day of January 13, he had an ironclad alibi that completely ruled out the possibility of committing this terrible crime. Well, Nikki Joe's interrogation left more questions than answers. If it wasn't him, then who was it? Another version began to form in my head. What if the murder was committed by Robert Head, the man Nikki Whitehead was living with at the time of the tragedy? Perhaps he found out about her secret communication with another man and decided to brutally take revenge on his unfaithful cohabitant. However, the version about Robert Head's involvement in the murder was quickly dropped. During the investigation, it was established that the man worked as a long-distance trucker and on the day of the tragedy was on a business trip in another state. So purely physically, he could not have been present at the crime scene and committed this terrible act. And so the cops found themselves at a dead end again. On the one hand, there was the mutilated body of a victim who died a terrible death. On the other hand, there was a complete absence of suspects or leads that could put us on the trail of the killer. As an experienced detective, I understood that in such cases you need to act methodically and not miss a single detail. The first thing law enforcement did was thoroughly search the crime scene and collect all possible evidence from blood traces to fingerprints and microfibers. All these samples were sent to the laboratory for examination. While they were waiting for the analysis results, it was decided to delve deeper into the personal life of Nikki Whitehead. It was necessary to find out who the deceased communicated with, what places she visited, what she was passionate about. The detectives were especially interested in the last weeks and days before the murder. Perhaps that's where the key to this horrifying story was hidden. And then Nikki's daughters Jasmia and Tasmia came to mind. After all, who could know more about a woman's life than her own children? The girls were the closest people to their mother and could remember some details or events that would help track down the criminal. The police decided to take the sisters to the station and carefully question them there in a calm environment. Of course, the girls had just experienced a terrible tragedy and were in a state of shock. On the way to the station, one of the patrolmen noticed Tasmia's strange behavior. She kept biting her hands hard until they bled. Her sister Jasmia explained that for Tasmia, this is a usual way to cope with nervous tension, especially in stressful situations. Like now, after such a shock, this is a completely normal reaction. During the interrogation, the detective began to have a vague, alarming feeling. At first, he attributed it to professional intuition, which often helped in investigations, but over time this feeling only intensified. First, the detective found it extremely suspicious that Tasmia and Jasmia seemed to be crying, 
but at the same time there was no trace of tears on their faces. It seemed as if they were squeezing out this cry. He's not going to come back. Playing to the audience, which was quite strange given the circumstances. Secondly, the detective could not help but notice how the girls spoke about their deceased mother. In their words, there were harsh, even offensive epithets about Nikki. You know, usually children who have just lost their parents remember them with special tenderness and even some idealization. But here everything was different. It seemed as if the girls were talking about some stranger or even a person they hated. And this led to certain thoughts. The longer the interrogation lasted, the more the detective became convinced that the sisters were hiding something. Whether out of fear or for some other reasons, but their testimonies constantly had some kind of understatement and contradictions. And this made us think, what if they themselves were somehow involved in this horrific story? In the end, the team of investigators decided to separate the girls and interrogate each one individually. Of course, they began to resist, begging not to separate them, but the investigators were adamant. Although it's not very pleasant to separate sisters who have just experienced such a tragedy, the interest of the investigation required this step. By the way, another interesting nuance Tasmia and Jasmia did not take off their gloves the whole time, even inside the police station. At first glance, it's a trifle, but in the context of the investigation, every detail can be important. So after completing the interrogation of Tasmia and Jasmia, the cops had a mixed impression. On the one hand, the girls seemed to be frank and admitted that lately their relationship with their mother had been, to put it mildly, strained. They even confessed that they sometimes thought about Nikki's death, but at the same time they insisted that they were not involved in the murder. On the other hand, it seemed that they were still hiding something. There were too many inconsistencies when comparing their testimonies obtained during separate interrogations. It's like putting together a puzzle, the pieces of which just won't fit together. And such a mismatch usually indicates a lie or concealment. Suspicions about the sisters only intensified after one incident. After the interrogation, the girls were sitting in the department room, hugging each other and seemingly crying. One of the employees, taking pity on them, approached and sympathetically asked if he could help them with something, do something for them. And then the unexpected happened, the sisters replied that they would like to watch TV. This moment just threw me off balance. Usually, children who have just lost their mother under such terrible circumstances are under such stress that TV is not even a question. But here as if nothing had happened, life goes on as usual. Such a reaction seemed somehow unnatural, and it only heightened the doubts of law enforcement officers. In the end, the investigators came to the conclusion that it was necessary to talk with the entourage of the Whitehead family, their friends, neighbors, acquaintances to ask them about how Nikki's relationship with her daughters was, what were the nuances of their family life. And you know, the very first conversations opened their eyes to many things. It turned out that during the interrogation, the girls significantly smoothed out the severity of intrafamily conflicts, presenting everything as if there were problems, but not too serious ones. However, reality turned out to be much gloomier. To begin with, Nikki Whitehead herself was not born in the most favorable conditions. At the time of giving birth, her mother was serving a sentence in prison for distributing prohibited psychotropic substances, so the little one was taken care of by her grandmother, Della Frazier. The woman felt very sorry for the girl, believed that she was already unlucky with the imprisoned mother, so from childhood she indulged all the whims of her granddaughter. When Nikki grew up, she repeatedly got involved with bad company and came to the attention of the police. Fortunately, somehow it did without serious consequences, but the fact remains the childhood and youth of the future victim were far from ideal. As for Della Frazier herself, after the detectives communicated with her, the impression was formed that this woman was excessively indulgent to the antics of her granddaughters. Perhaps she loved them in her own way, but she absolutely did not know how to keep them within the framework of discipline to resist their whims. So the girls got used to the fact that their grandmother allows and indulges everything. All this only emphasizes the unhealthy atmosphere in which the sisters grew up. As it turns out, at the age of 17, she gave birth to twins Tasmia and Jasmia. Almost nothing was known about the girl's father, only that shortly after their birth, he married another woman and moved to Canada, actually leaving the children to fend for themselves. According to eyewitnesses, despite her young age, Nikki sincerely rejoiced in motherhood and loved her daughters very much. But the trouble was that without a job and her own housing, the young mother was forced to give the little ones to her grandmother for upbringing, and she herself went to earn money. In fact, for several years, she disappeared from the life of Tasmia and Jasmia, only rarely visiting them and sending money. But the immediate upbringing of the girls was carried out exclusively by the grandmother. 
Interestingly, despite such difficult circumstances, the sisters grew up to be very smart and diligent. According to teachers at school, they demonstrated remarkable success, were excellent students. In addition, they were engaged in art circles, participated in the scout movement. And Della Frazier herself did not hide that she dreams of a brilliant future for her granddaughter's admission to prestigious universities, a decent career. It would seem that despite her daughter's early pregnancy and her irresponsibility, the woman managed to raise the girls properly. But as often happens behind the screen of well-being, a completely different reality was hidden. After talking with family acquaintances, the investigators realized that Della made the same mistake that she once did with Nikki. She brought up her granddaughters in an atmosphere of permissiveness and indulgence of whims. That is, if at school the girls behaved flawlessly, then at home they did not listen to their grandmother at all, did not recognize any rules or restrictions, and the woman could do nothing about it. But the real problems began when Robert Head appeared in Nikki's life. Although the man was much older than her, Nikki sincerely fell in love with him and soon moved in with him. And then she decided to take her daughters to live with her, filing a corresponding lawsuit in court. And the court sided with her when the girls were seven years old. They moved to their mother and her new cohabitant. It would seem that finally the children were reunited with their own mother. They had a full-fledged home. But not everything was so cloudless. Robert, who worked as a long-distance trucker, was often away. And while he was absent, the girls seemed to break loose. Accustomed to permissiveness at their grandmothers, now they took Nikki's attempts to discipline them, to teach them at least some rules with hostility. They openly rebelled against the routine established by their mother. Although in fact it was quite reasonable lessons, limited time for walks, no gadgets before bed, and so on. But the girls were not going to put up with such oppression. According to neighbors, they tried in every possible way to circumvent their mother's prohibitions, and when she discovered disobedience, they quarreled with her through tantrums. It got to the point that Nikki began to take away phones from her daughters and forbid them to watch TV for their misdeeds. For girls who were used to free men at their grandmothers, this was a real drama, and they openly declared that they were not going to endure it. So slowly, day by day, the conflict between mother and daughters only escalated, and I understood that this discord could result in something worse than just quarrels and tantrums. It remained only to guess how far could the girls go to finally throw off the maternal shackles. Be that as it may, Nikki Whitehead did not give up. Even at 25, having become the mother of two already adult girls, she tried to build the right model of life for them. Yes, sometimes it was not easy for her, and the methods were sometimes too harsh, but the woman sincerely strove to give her daughters what she herself did not receive at their age. Having obtained custody of the children, Nikki immediately established clear rules. Right after school lessons, time for walks and entertainment was strictly limited. At night, no phones or other gadgets. Complete obedience and submission to the mother. For any offense punishment, from confiscation of equipment to a ban on watching TV. For girls who had lived for years in the permissiveness of their grandmother's upbringing, this came as a real culture shock. At some point, Robert Head, Nikki's cohabitant, witnessed one of these quarrels and then a completely different relationship developed between him and the girls. When the man was at home, they behaved restrainedly, even a little afraid of him. But as soon as Robert left for another trip on a long-distance truck, the sisters seemed to break loose. Conflicts with their mother literally happened every day. The woman desperately tried to cope with her rebellious daughters, but where there are no hands, they openly laughed at her attempts to educate them, to set some kind of framework. This daily struggle drained Nikki morally and physically, she was torn between work and the constant need to reign in her disobedient girls. But even then, the thought occurred to me. Was this pedagogy limited only to moral pressure and strict punishments? Perhaps in the heat of another conflict, it even came to assault. At least some family acquaintances hinted that sometimes quarrels moved into a dangerous phase. But what really happened there behind closed doors remained only to guess. It would seem that after so many conflicts and even police intervention, the situation should have somehow improved. But no, the quarrels between Nikki and her daughters only escalated. Once, after another call, my colleagues again came to the Whitehead house, and they found a familiar picture there. A frightened Nikki claimed that her daughters had attacked her with their fists as soon as the door closed behind the police. However, something didn't add up in this story. When the cops went upstairs to the sister's room, they unanimously assured that it was their mother who attacked them, not the other way around. Only the girl's words sounded extremely unconvincing. Unlike Nikki, whose hands were covered with fresh scratches and bruises, there was not a single abrasion on Tasmia and Jasmia, and this led to certain reflections. 
In the end, the girls were taken to the police station that day, and later a trial was held over them. Having weighed all the circumstances, the servants of Themis came to the conclusion that it would be better for the daughters to return to the care of their grandmother, and they should be temporarily isolated from Nikki. It was thought that Della Frazier would be able to curb her unruly granddaughters. But no, even this indulgent woman could not handle the sisters who had completely gotten out of hand. They openly neglected her authority, did everything their own way, regardless of comments or requests. And with age, their behavior became more and more aggressive. The girls repeatedly came to the attention of the police due to minor offenses and clashes. At the same time, Della continued to desperately make excuses for them, despite the obviousness of the problem. The woman sincerely loved her granddaughters and justified them in everything. But child protection specialist understood. The elderly Mrs. Frazier no longer has the strength and ability to raise two teenagers with such deviations. Someone was needed who could take the girls under strict but fair control. And then all eyes again turned to Nikki Whitehead. Despite all the complexity of her relationship with her daughters, she remained their mother and great hopes were pinned on her. So at the beginning of 2010, when the sisters turned 16, another court session took place. Its verdict was as follows. The girls must return to their mother for two weeks, a kind of probationary period. There were rumors that during this time, the supervisory authorities repeatedly visited Nikki's house to make sure that everything was okay, and allegedly there were no changes. The girls remained just as disobedient and problematic. However, the guardianship specialists stubbornly turned a blind eye to this. They hoped that during these two weeks, the daughters would somehow come to an understanding with their mother, find a common language. But as it turned out, Tasmia and Jasmia themselves were extremely dissatisfied with this decision. They unanimously declared that they did not want to live under the same roof with Nikki, that they preferred to stay with their grandmother. It seemed that the prospect of spending at least a few weeks with their own mother caused them almost panic fear. And in my opinion, such a reaction was very indicative. But no matter how much the girls protested, no one listened to them. Everyone around stubbornly believed that these two weeks would be fateful for the Whitehead sisters. That it was during this time that they would finally come to an understanding with their mother, begin a new life as a normal, healthy family. How could they have imagined then what a horrific surprise awaited them in the near future? And so, after long vicissitudes and disputes, Tasmia and Jasmia still found themselves in the house of their mother Nikki Whitehead and her cohabitant Robert Head. The girls had just turned 16 and they were to spend two fateful weeks with their mother, a kind of probationary period that was to determine their future life. But fate decreed otherwise. Just eight days after the start of this experiment, the irreparable happened Nikki was found dead in her own home. The woman became a victim of a brutal murder, the circumstances of which shocked even seasoned police officers. Since all the evidence against the Whitehead sisters was indirect and circumstantial, the girls had to be released. They returned to their adored grandmother and at first glance began to live their usual life, the same as they led before their mother took them to live with her for the last time. According to relatives and neighbors, the girls became simply inseparable. If before they spent a lot of time together anyway, now they did not leave each other for a single step at all. As if they were afraid of getting lost or losing that invisible but strong sisterly bond. But the change in their behavior was most striking. If before the tragedy Tasmia and Jasmia were rather noisy and problematic girls, now they behaved quietly and calmly. Against the backdrop of accusations and gossip that rained down on them after their mother's death, the sisters seemed to be trying to become as inconspicuous as possible. At school, they almost stopped communicating with their peers. Immediately after classes, they hurried home. It seemed that the girls deliberately avoided any contact with the outside world, as if fearing unwanted attention to their persons. Meanwhile, the investigation into the murder of Nikki Whitehead was delayed for many months. The investigation carefully collected and checked all possible evidence, interviewed witnesses, put forward versions. But despite all efforts, the case did not budge for a long time. It seemed as if the criminal had not left a single trace, a single clue that could be grasped. And so in May, the results of the examinations of the evidence collected at the crime scene finally came. For me, they did not become some kind of revelation rather. They only confirmed those suspicions that arose immediately after acquaintance with the case. First, the bite marks on the hands of Tasmia and Jasmia perfectly matched the dental impressions of their murdered mother. Remember the episode when Tasmia suddenly began to bite her hand in the police car as if from severe stress? As it turned out, she did it not at all because of nervous tension. It was a desperate but extremely stupid way to mask the traces of her mother's teeth on her skin. Secondly, two boxes with their shoes were found in the sister's room. 
on which traces of Nicky Whitehead's blood were clearly visible, and also that missing stack of towels from the bathroom, which I mentioned earlier, it was found stuffed into the washing machine, soaked in blood not only of the victim, but also of the twins themselves. These and other facts eloquently testified that it was not some mysterious malefactors who were involved in Nikki's death, but two people dear to her, Tasmia and Jasmia, teenagers whom she so desperately tried to curb and put on the true path, her own daughters. The only question that remained somewhat vague was the distribution of the sisters' roles in the commission of the crime. DNA examination was powerless to determine to which of the twins certain biological traces belonged. However, I had practically no doubt that the girls acted together and deliberately. The murder of the mother was not some tragic coincidence, it was planned and implemented as a well-organized and thought-out crime. Of course, the young age and the stunning cruelty of the deed could raise doubts. Are these delicate 16-year-old creatures really capable of such brutality? But unfortunately, my many years of practice show that anyone is capable of murder. And if a person has already decided to cross the line of law and morality age and gender do not play the main role at all. Additional confirmation of this version was the video recording from the surveillance cameras of the school where the girls studied. It clearly shows how on the day of the murder, January 13, Tasmia and Jasmia enter the educational institution together at 10.17 in the morning. That is, in fact, they are late for half of the lessons. This raised a lot of questions. After all, if everything was as the sisters told at first, they should have left the house at 7.30 and, in the worst case, been late for some half an hour. Instead, we see the absence of girls in several classes in a row. And this leads to certain reflections, what were they doing all this time? Where were they and what were they doing instead of sitting at their desks? Of course, at first the thought arose that Tasmia and Jasmia could simply skip classes like many other teenagers. But in the context of all the circumstances, this version looked unlikely. Unfortunately, it looked much more like the girls spent the morning hours implementing their horrific plan. Realizing the seriousness of the suspicions and the evidence collected, on May 21, our group went to the Whitehead Sister School. Right on the territory of the educational institution, in front of the stunned students and teachers, the detention of Tasmia and Jasmia took place. The girls were placed in an official car to be taken to the police station for further investigative actions. And here we witnessed a striking change in the behavior of the sisters. If earlier they pretended to be frightened and confused victims of circumstances, now they seem to have dropped their masks. In the police car, the girls began to behave defiantly, even aggressively. They unanimously declared their non-involvement in the crime, accusing the cops of deliberately appointing them guilty in order to close the high-profile case as soon as possible. Even being in the police station, in the interrogation room, the sisters stubbornly refused to admit their guilt. It seemed that neither the iron evidence nor the psychological pressure was able to break through this wall of defiant silence. Tasmia and Jasmia sat side by side, tightly pursing their lips and looking at one point. In their eyes, one could read not only fright, but also some strange determination like that of people who have already made a fateful decision. Looking back, I think it was at that moment that we all finally saw the true face of the Whitehead sisters. Not frightened children, not victims of circumstances, but two young individuals capable of a brutal and insidious crime. Cold-blooded, prudent murderers, despite their 16 years. On July 12, after a thorough study of all the evidence and circumstances of the case, Tasmia and Jasmia were officially charged with the premeditated murder of their mother, Nikki. The girls were taken into custody before the trial, without the right to bail the charges against them were too serious. But the most interesting thing happened a little later. Realizing that the weight of evidence against them was irrefutable, the sisters suddenly decided to confess, and what they told during the next interrogation made even us, seasoned police officers, shudder. According to the girls, when their stepfather Robert was away, Nikki often drank. Moreover, she did it not like a normal person who wants to relax with a glass of wine, but abused it in a big way. Tasmia and Jasmia even suggested that sometimes their mother indulged in illegal substances so inadequate was her behavior at such moments. With tears in their eyes, the sisters told how their drunken mother picked on them for any reason, provoked scandals out of the blue, and also that even when sober, Nikki was very cold and detached with them. The girls did not see any warmth or maternal love from her. Furthermore, on the eve of the tragedy, another drunken quarrel occurred. Nikki, pretty tipsy, began to yell at her daughters, calling them names. The scandal lasted almost until the morning, and only in the morning tired, they all fell asleep but they were not destined to rest. Just a few hours later, Nikki again burst into the girls' room and began to wake them up, they say it's time for school. 
At the same time, she carelessly poked them with a spoon and mumbled something about studying and responsibilities. And when the sisters went down to the kitchen to have breakfast, another conflict broke out over nothing. Then the sisters told quite terrible things about how they, unable to withstand the bullying, attacked their mother with a knife, how they dealt blow after blow until she fell dead, how they dragged the bloody body to the bathroom to somehow cover their tracks, how they washed the floor with towels but still could not remove all the blood. And after this horrific cleaning, the girls simply changed clothes, hid their shoes with traces of blood away and, as if nothing had happened, went to school. When asked why they did not immediately tell the truth, the sisters did not give a clear answer. They only shrugged their shoulders and looked away. At the trial, Tasmia and Jasmia fully admitted their guilt. Without unnecessary emotions or attempts to justify themselves, they simply confirmed everything that they said during the interrogations. For the premeditated murder of their mother, the Whitehead sisters were sentenced to 30 years in prison. Their lawyer stated that such a sentence gives the girls hope for the future, they say, if they had not admitted guilt, the term could have been much tougher. Interestingly, even after being behind bars, the sisters managed to finish their schooling. Their grandmother, Della Frazier, was present even at the graduation. Despite all the horror of what her granddaughters did, the old woman continues to love and support them. An amazing woman, in my opinion. In 2017, Tasmia and Jasmia filed a petition for parole. But fortunately, they were denied. If they do not receive more parole, they will be released only in 2044 when both will already be 47. I hope that during this time they will realize the full weight of their crime and repent. Although, to be honest, it's hard to believe in it. This is such a terrible and eerie story, friends. A story about how hatred and cruelty can poison even the closest people about how important it is to notice the alarming signs in time and react to them, and that nothing in this world justifies such a brutal crime, not even teenage maximalism or difficult family relationships. I sincerely hope that I will never have to deal with such things again, but to be honest something tells me that this is far from the last case when you have to look into the abyss of the human soul. Unfortunately, our work consists precisely of this. Take care of yourself and your loved ones, and may there be as few reasons as possible in your life to turn to cops like me. Thank you for your attention. This was Detective Brooks. You may like some of my next suggested videos. I love you so likes, subscribes and comments. See you next time. When I, Detective John Brooks, received an urgent call to a crime scene, my heart already sensed that something unusual awaited me. Years of experience told me this wouldn't be an ordinary case. Parking my car near an abandoned house on the outskirts of the city, I took a deep breath and crossed the threshold. What greeted my eyes in the living room made me freeze in place. In the middle of the room, hanging from the chandelier, was the body of a young man. Moving closer, I recognized the deceased as 24-year-old Ashley Donovan, a student at the local university. His face was distorted by the agony of death and a rope was tightened around his neck. A terrible sight that you wouldn't wish on anyone. I began carefully examining the body, searching for any signs of violence or struggle. Strangely, apart from the strangulation mark on the neck, there were no other marks on the body. No bruises, no scratches. As if the young man had put the noose around his own neck with his own hands. What do you think, detective? The medical examiner asked, removing his gloves after examining the body. It's too early to draw conclusions, I replied, furrowing my brow. But something doesn't add up here. Ashley was a young and promising student. Why would he suddenly decide to take his own life? Without a note, without an obvious reason. There's something fishy here. We need to dig deeper. The medical examiner nodded in agreement. He too felt that this case was not as simple as it seemed at first glance. I carefully inspected the room once more, searching every corner. Unfortunately, I found nothing else of note. No signs of a break-in, no signs of a struggle, just the mess typical of a single student's dwelling. However, one item did catch my attention. On the table lay the deceased's cell phone, a modern smartphone with a cracked screen. It must have fallen during the tragic events, or maybe someone deliberately broke it to hide some evidence. We'll start with this, I decided mentally, carefully picking up the phone with latex gloved hands. If we can unlock it, it can tell us a lot about Ashley's last hours. Taking the phone as evidence, I headed to the station. A lot of work lay ahead. It was necessary to notify the family, question friends and acquaintances, and check the social media circle. 
If you're interested in finding out what shocking events will happen next, then subscribe to the channel so you don't miss anything. And be sure to watch the video to the end, because what happened next just turned my mind upside down. But most importantly, I had to find out what drove Ashley to this desperate step. Was it really suicide? Or did someone masterfully stage a suicide to hide a murder? My experience told me that the truth lay somewhere in the victim's past, and I was determined to get to the bottom of it, no matter how horrifying it might be. The next morning, I began interviewing the relatives and loved ones of the deceased Ashley Donovan. It was a routine but always difficult part of the job seeing the pain of loss in people's eyes, forcing them to relive bitter moments. First, I visited Ashley's mother, Sarah. She met me at the doorstep, pale and haggard with grief. Tears stood in her eyes, her hands trembling as she invited me into the living room. Ashley was my greatest joy, Sarah said softly, sinking onto the couch. He grew up such a cheerful, inquisitive boy. He always dreamed of becoming a doctor, dedicating his life to saving others. I never thought he would. Her voice broke off, tears streaming down her cheeks. I nodded sympathetically, giving her time to recover. Mrs. Donovan, I understand how difficult this is for you, I said gently. Believe me, I will do everything possible to find out what happened to Ashley. Have you noticed any changes in his behavior recently? Did he seem sad or worried about something? No, not at all, Sarah shook her head in denial. Ashley always shared everything with me, his successes, plans, dreams. He couldn't have. Couldn't have suddenly decided to do this. It's not like him, detective. Someone or something drove my boy to this horrible step. I put my hand on her shoulder reassuringly, promising to make every effort in the investigation. But deep down, I felt that the suicide version should not be discarded. Something about this case was bothering me. Next on my list was Michael Ashley's best friend, with whom they were inseparable since school. Meeting in a cozy coffee shop, I got straight to the point. Michael, you knew Ashley better than anyone, I began, looking the young man in the eye. If he had any secrets, problems you probably know about them. Please tell me anything that might be important. Michael sighed, nervously squeezing a paper cup of coffee in his hands. You know, detective, a few days before. Before Ashley passed away, he went on a date, with some girl he found on Tinder. He was terribly nervous before the meeting, kept repeating what an incredible beauty she was. But when he came back from the date, Michael faltered, remembering something. Something changed in him since then, he finally said. Ashley became kind of aloof, thoughtful, as if something was bothering him, gnawing at him from the inside. I tried to ask what happened, but he just brushed it off, saying, forget it, man. It's not what it seems. We never returned to that topic again. I thanked Michael, assuring him that this information could be extremely important to the investigation. It seemed they had given me a valuable clue. The mysterious girl from Tinder who had so impressed Ashley. Could she somehow be connected to his death? Retrieving the deceased phone, I set about studying his contacts and messages. Fortunately, my colleagues had managed to crack the password, and now all the data was at my disposal. There it was. In the call logs, I noticed several incoming calls from an unknown number that came in just before Ashley's death. The number was not listed in his contacts. Very strange. The next step was Tinder. Looking through the sparse profile details, I came across the account of a girl named Aubrey. A stunning blonde with a coquettish smile and a mesmerizing green-eyed gaze. Could this be the one who captured Ashley's heart? Well, dear Aubrey, it seems we have something to talk about, I muttered sending an official request to Tinder to disclose information about the profile owner. Something told me that the meeting was not so simple, and I wouldn't let go of this Aubrey until I found out the whole truth. Maybe she was some kind of scammer who deceived lonely men, or was she connected to a criminal group? And maybe, the thought made me uneasy. Maybe Ashley didn't come to meet a person at all. If we recall Michael's words about the unexpected changes in his behavior after the date, no enough, I had to think like a professional, Discarding the eerie fantasies, I focused on the rational. Under any circumstances, a meeting with Aubrey was essential. She was the key to all the secrets, and I wouldn't rest until I unraveled this bizarre tangle. But what happened next was simply shocking. That evening, I stayed late at the station, trying to piece together all the parts of this eerie puzzle. It seemed that the solution was close, but something kept slipping away, not giving me peace. Suddenly, the door to the office opened, and my partner, Sergeant David Foster, appeared on the threshold. His face was pale and tense, as if he had just seen a ghost. John, you have to see this, he exhaled. We have another body. Looks like a suicide, but... 
Hearing those words, I instantly jumped up from my chair, throwing on my jacket as I walked. Another death? Could it be connected to Ashley Donovan's case again? What the hell? I muttered, getting into the car. Give me the details, David. A young man, 23 years old, a business school student. Jaden McKenzie, my partner began, starting the engine. Found him dead in his own bathroom an hour ago. Wrist slashed, bled out in the water. No signs of a struggle or breaking into the house. Classic suicide. These words felt like a scalding splash. It was too similar to Ashley's case. Could there be a connection between these deaths? When we arrived at the scene, a team of experts was already waiting for me. Taking a deep breath, I crossed the threshold of the bathroom and froze in place. In front of me, in the blood-red water, lay Jaden's lifeless body. His wrists were slit with one precise movement, his eyes closed, his face pale and calm, just like Ashley. Two similar suicides of young men in a matter of days. This can't be a mere coincidence, I muttered, looking closely at the details. David, find his phone. We need to check the calls and messages for the past week. My partner nodded and left the room. Meanwhile, I continued to carefully study every inch of the crime scene, looking for at least some clue. And suddenly, my gaze stopped on the mirror. On the steamy surface, as if drawn with a finger on the glass, was a chilling message. She will never let go. I felt an icy chill run down my spine. Could this be a message from the killer? Because now I was almost certain that both young men had fallen victim to the same person. A person who masterfully stages suicides, leaving no traces. A seasoned cop's instincts told me that this person was Violet Winters. The mysterious girl from Tinder whose name had come up in both cases. It seemed she was involved in the deaths of both Ashley and Jaden. If only I had known then what would happen next. I'll never forget this case. Let's continue, I promise it will be very interesting. Returning to the station, I immediately sent a request to the local mobile service provider to obtain data on Jaden McKenzie's calls and correspondence for the past week. If he had also communicated with Violet, it would be proof of her involvement. The next morning, I arrived at the address where the main suspect, Violet Winters, lived. It turned out to be an old two-story house that stood alone on the shore of a picturesque lake outside the city. I parked the car and slowly walked to the door, once again mentally going over all the facts. Two young men who had communicated with the same girl shortly before their deaths. Strange messages and phone calls. Otherworldly signs at the crime scenes. All this could not be a mere coincidence. Gathering my thoughts, I resolutely knocked on the door. However, no one answered. I tried again louder. Suddenly, the door opened and Violet Winters herself appeared on the threshold. The beautiful blonde from the photo, only her look was not at all welcoming. Violet Winters, I asked, showing my police badge. Detective Brooks, Homicide Department. I'm investigating the deaths of Ashley Donovan and Jaden McKenzie. It is known that you communicated with both of them shortly before their deaths. May I have a word with you? For a moment, a look of fear flashed in the girl's eyes, but she quickly composed herself. I'm not going to tell you anything without a lawyer, Violet snapped, folding her arms across her chest. And anyway, how dare you accuse me of anything? You have no evidence. So far, I'm not accusing you of anything, Miss Winters, I replied calmly, trying to speak as softly as possible. I just want to ask a few questions. I'm sure you can shed some light on certain details. I'm not going to say anything to you, okay? Violet interrupted me. Not a word, and now get out of here before I call the police for harassment. And she slammed the door right in my face with force. I had to jerk back to avoid getting hit in the face. What a fiery person. But I wasn't going to give up that easily. Not now, when I felt she was hiding something. I was about to get into the car and drive away. I understood that without a search warrant, I couldn't do anything anyway. But I had to somehow persuade Violet to make contact in order to find out what she knew about the dead boys. But then something incredible happened. Something that completely defied the usual picture of the world. Hey you, stop right there, rang out a clear girl's voice. I whirled around and was stunned. Looking out of the second floor window was. Violet Winters, the same girl who had closed the door in front of me a few seconds ago. What do you think you're doing, huh? Don't you dare come here again, she shouted, her eyes flashing angrily. Or I'll call the cops and accuse you of stalking. Blinking in amazement, I just nodded and slowly headed for the car. Strange feelings overwhelmed me. How the hell did this Violet manage to get to the second floor in seconds? Sitting in the car, I involuntarily glanced back at the house, and I almost cried out in surprise. Violet was standing in the first floor window again. 
She was looking at me grimly, as if checking to see if I was really leaving. But how is that possible? She was just upstairs. Could I be having hallucinations from stress and lack of sleep? Because this defied all the laws of logic and common sense. Shaking my head, I started the engine and sped off to the station. I needed to urgently gather my thoughts and decide what to do next. Maybe I should really see a doctor, or try to talk to Violet again, to prove that I was not an enemy and just wanted to find the truth. For a moment I wondered. Even with my own experience, I had never encountered such a strange and eerie investigation. It was as if something otherworldly had decided to intervene in human affairs. A bad premonition gnawed at me from the inside. In any case, I had to unravel this mystery. To find the connection between Violet and the dead boys, to prove or disprove her guilt. Even if I had to fight against the ice of human distrust and my own skepticism. The truth was worth fighting for. But it turns out this was not the only thing that would leave me in a state of shock. It was just flowers compared to what awaited me next. The next morning, I, Detective John Brooks, called a meeting at the police station. Gathering my colleagues in the office, I told them about my suspicions regarding Violet Winters and her possible involvement in the deaths of Ashley Donovan and Jaden McKenzie. Listen guys, I began, surveying those present with a serious look. This girl is clearly hiding something. She communicated with both of the deceased shortly before their deaths, and she behaved extremely strangely and suspiciously during our conversation. Do you think she could be involved somehow? Asked my partner, Sergeant David Foster. Maybe luring the boys into a trap and then killing them? I can't say for sure yet, I sighed. But I do know that we need a warrant to search her house. She refuses to make contact, so we'll have to act through the court. My colleagues agreed with me. We quickly drafted a request to the judge asking for a warrant based on the available facts and suspicions. However, unfortunately, the servant of Themis did not find sufficient grounds for such a radical step. Allegedly, the mere fact of the suspect's acquaintance with the victims was not enough for an intrusion into her home and private life. I could barely restrain myself from lashing out. Would all my guesses go to waste? Would Violet be able to slip away just because we didn't have enough formal grounds for a search? No, I wouldn't give up that easily. Suddenly, the door opened and Michael Wright, our chief cybercrime specialist, entered the office. He was holding some printouts and looked excited. Boss, there's progress, Michael blurted out. We managed to hack into Jaden McKenzie's phone. Guess what we found? Come on, tell me, don't keep me in suspense, I urged him, feeling my heart beat faster. It looks like before his death, Jaden was actively texting with some Aubrey. See for yourself photos, messages, hints of meetings. And this Aubrey is the spitting image of Violet Winters. Wright laid out the printouts on the table. I grabbed the papers, quickly scanning the lines. There it was. The girl in the selfies was a copy of Violet. It seemed that under a fictitious name, she met the boys and then, then something terrible happened to them. Damn, so that's what it is, I exclaimed, feeling as if the puzzle pieces were coming together in my head. She's definitely involved. Guys, urgently prepare a request to the mobile operator. We need to track all calls and messages between our victims and this winters for the past few weeks. My colleagues nodded approvingly and set about executing the order. Meanwhile, I was thinking intensely. Even if Violet had indeed communicated with the deceased, it was not yet proof of her guilt. We needed something more substantial. Suddenly it hit me. Exactly. There was one risky but effective way. I grabbed the phone and quickly dialed the number of my longtime informant Ricky Smith, who worked as a courier for a delivery service. Ricky, it's Brooks. Listen carefully, I have an important task for you, I said when he answered. You know I'm currently investigating the case of those mysterious suicides of young men, right? Sure, I've heard. So any progress? Smith asked with interest. Maybe. I need you to get into a house. Pretend you've come to deliver an order and discreetly install hidden cameras and microphones. Can you handle it? No problem, boss. Just tell me the address and I'll do it in the best possible way. I quickly dictated the coordinates of Violet Winter's house and hung up. I knew that Ricky was a pro and could be trusted. Now the main thing was to play the combination correctly. The plan worked like clockwork. Posing as a courier, Smith managed to get inside the suspect's home and imperceptibly bug it. The distrustful Violet didn't even suspect anything amiss, she just signed the documents for receiving the fake package. When the informant reported to me about the successful completion of the operation, I couldn't contain a triumphant smile. Well, my dear, now I have you in the palm of my hand, I muttered, turning on the monitor with a live broadcast from Winter's house. 
Let's see what secrets you're hiding behind seven locks. The denouement was close. I felt I was closer to the truth than ever. All that remained was to be patient and wait for Violet to give herself away, and I had no doubt that sooner or later it would happen. This girl was clearly nervous during our last meeting, shouting and trying to get rid of me as quickly as possible. Why would she panic like that if she were innocent? The only question was what exactly she was hiding. Could she really be involved in the deaths of Ashley and Jaden? Or maybe she was just afraid of something. Or someone. In any case, the truth was close. It only remained not to let it slip through my fingers. But what happened the next day completely turned my mind upside down. It seemed to me that I had seen everything in my career, but it turned out that was not the case. A few days passed and I, Detective John Brooks, finally received data from the mobile operator. The correspondence between the dead boys and the mysterious Aubrey turned out to be even more terrifying than I expected. With trembling hands, I opened the file and began to read the messages that this Aubrey had sent to Jaden shortly before his death. Each word seemed to sear my brain, evoking feelings of disgust and anxiety. Kill yourself, or we will torture you to the end of your days. We will never leave you alone. You are doomed, that's what this girl wrote to the boy. I couldn't believe my eyes. Who could send something like that? What sick imagination was capable of such threats? Next, I came across Jaden's reply. Poor guy, he was clearly in despair and didn't understand what was happening. Who are you? Why are you doing this? He asked. But there was no answer, only ominous silence. I felt shivers run down my spine. No, this definitely didn't look like an ordinary coincidence or accident. It reeked of some sinister ritual or mental disorder. And worst of all, Violet Winters seemed to be up to her neck in this. Could this quiet and unremarkable girl somehow be involved in the deaths of the boys? The thought made me uneasy. While I was trying to make sense of this eerie correspondence, the phone rang. It was the patrol officers. They had found the body of another student, Lucas Highland, who had died from an overdose of pills. Detective, you won't believe it, I heard the excited voice of Officer Miller. We checked his phone, and it turned out that the day before his death, he was also texting with some Aubrey. Is that so? I said grimly. I see. Thanks for letting me know. We'll take action. I hung up the phone and pondered. The situation was becoming more and more confusing and terrifying, but I couldn't delay any longer. It was time for decisive action. I urgently need a warrant to search the Winter's house, I declared, bursting into Judge Pearson's office. There are strong reasons to believe that she is involved in a series of suicides among students. The judge carefully studied the evidence I provided and eventually issued the warrant. Armed with this document, I accompanied by a whole police squad headed to Violet's house, hoping to catch the suspect off guard. The door was opened by the girl herself. Seeing armed cops on the doorstep, she turned pale and tried to flee, but she couldn't get far. Two strong officers quickly caught up with her and handcuffed her. Search the house, I commanded. Every corner, every closet. Don't miss anything. The cops scattered around the rooms. While they were doing their job, I decided to talk to the detainee. So, Violet, I asked sternly, maybe you'll tell me what you've done. Why did you do it? But the girl just stared at me with frightened eyes and remained silent. And then something incredible happened. Out of one of the rooms came. Another Violet, the spitting image of the one we had just detained. I caught my breath. It seemed the suspect had a twin sister. That's why her behavior seemed so strange and incomprehensible. Take this one too, I ordered the cops. We're taking them both to the station. Now I faced a difficult task to unravel this eerie tangle and understand what exactly had happened to the dead boys and what role these mysterious sisters had played in it. But I was determined to see it through to the end. For the sake of justice and the memory of the innocent victims. I sat in my office reviewing the footage from the hidden cameras we had installed in the Winter's sister's house. While my colleagues were interrogating the girls at the station, I hoped to find some evidence of their involvement in the students' deaths on these recordings. What I saw on the screen made my blood run cold. My hands were shaking and my heart was pounding like crazy. I couldn't believe my own eyes. The footage showed Lucas Highland, one of the dead boys, running around the house in a panic as if fleeing from someone. His face was contorted with horror and blood-curdling screams burst from his throat. Strangely, no one was chasing him. At least that's how it seemed at first glance. What the hell? I muttered, leaning closer to the monitor. And then something incredible happened. One of the Winter's sisters appeared in the hallway. Lucas noticed her and rushed to the other exit. 
but the second sister was already waiting for him there. The boy darted about like a cornered beast, clearly not understanding what was happening. I held my breath, watching this eerie scene. The sisters constantly pursued Lucas, smiling ominously. They seemed to be playing some twisted game with him, relishing his fear and despair. God, what is this? I whispered, feeling cold sweat running down my back. Suddenly Lucas ran into a dead end. I froze, not even daring to breathe. The sisters slowly approached him, holding some object in their hands. Looking closer, I realized it was a bottle of pills. They said something to the boy, offering him these medicines. The screen suddenly went black. It seemed that at that very moment, the camera had turned off. But what I had seen was enough for me. With trembling hands, I reached for the phone. Hello, the station. It's Brooks. Urgently gather a group. We're taking the Winters sisters. Yes, right now, and call an ambulance. We might need it. Putting down the receiver, I grabbed my head. God, these chicks were just some kind of psychopaths. They lured the boys to them, drove them crazy with their antics, and then forced them to take their own lives. Now I understood why it had always seemed to me that Violet was teleporting. In fact, the sisters were working in pairs, taking turns scaring their victims to death. And the eerie sounds, it seemed, were simply broadcast through speakers to enhance the effect. Nothing, I'll get to you, I hissed through my teeth, pulling on my jacket. You'll pay for everything, you freaks. On my way to the station, I mentally prepared for the interrogation. The main thing now was to make these witches confess. I had to find out at any cost what exactly had pushed them to such atrocities. Revenge, jealousy, or just a morbid thirst for murder. It was inconceivable that someone was capable of this for the sake of entertainment. Detective, we've got them, Sergeant Jackson reported when I burst into the station. They're silent for now, but we're pressing. Sooner or later, we'll break them. Good, I nodded. Keep me posted. I'll talk to them myself and call their lawyer. I don't want them to say later that we're violating procedure. While I was waiting for the lawyer, I mentally replayed what I had seen on the recordings once more. How could I not have noticed right away that there were two sisters? After all, there were hints. Violet's strange behavior, incomprehensible movements around the house. I had missed it, the old fool. Nothing, I'll make up for it, I promised myself. I won't let these psychopaths get off scot-free. They will answer for every lost life, for every crippled fate. Even if I have to turn this whole damn station upside down. The lawyer arrived and the interrogation began. I wasn't going to coddle these freaks. They had to pay for everything. And they would pay, or I'm not Detective John Brooks. But even in this state, I was not prepared for the horrors that these monsters began to tell me. You have to hear this. So I sat across from the Winters sisters in the interrogation room. They stubbornly denied everything, pretending to be innocent lambs. Allegedly, the boys had taken their own lives, and they had nothing to do with it. But I wasn't going to fall for their lies. Slowly, with pressure, I began to lay out the evidence in front of them, the correspondence with the deceased, the surveillance camera footage. With each new fact, their faces paled and fear appeared in their eyes. So, are you going to confess? I asked sternly, staring at one of the sisters. Or are we going to continue playing the silent game? The girl trembled and suddenly burst into tears. It was all just a prank, you know, like a joke, she exclaimed through her tears. We didn't know they would really kill themselves. We thought they would just fray their nerves and that's it. I felt anger boiling up inside me. So that's what it was, a prank. Jokes hard they had. That's not true. The other sister suddenly intervened. Her eyes blazed with genuine hatred. We were taking revenge, do you understand? Taking revenge for the fact that two freaks nearly raped us in our first year of college. Since then, all men are scum to us who deserve the worst. I recoiled in surprise. This was definitely not what I expected to hear. The sisters, crying in turn, told about that horrible incident, about how they had barely escaped from two inhuman classmates at some party, and how that event had changed their lives forever. Wait, but you could have gone to the police, I said in surprise. File a report, get those scumbags punished. Why take the law into your own hands? Do you think anyone would have believed us? One of the sisters smiled bitterly. Two girls against the university's favorite athletes, we would have ended up being blamed for seducing them. We realized that all men are just beasts who want only one thing, the other one sobbed. And we decided to teach them a lesson, to show them what it's like to feel fear and helplessness. They said they had chosen their victims on Tinder, mostly young and naive boys who were quickly taken in by their beauty. And then they had drawn them into their nets with the help of drugs and intimidation. 
We slipped them psychotropics to disorient them, the older sister confessed. And then we scared them out of their wits, creating the illusion that someone was hunting them. The poor things had no idea that all this horror was just a hallucination. So they took their own lives just to escape this nightmare, I concluded grimly. And you then were carrying out your justice, an eye for an eye, right? We thought we were doing good, the younger one sobbed. But it turned out that we had become monsters ourselves. Listening to this confession, I could barely contain my disgust. Of course, I understood their pain and indignation. What those inhuman people had done to them was horrible and unacceptable. But did it give them the right to take other people's lives? To make innocent boys pay for someone else's sins? In the end, the court found the Winters sisters guilty and sentenced them to 15 years in prison. I personally testified against them, recounting all the gruesome details of their crimes. Now these girls would end up behind bars for a long time and wouldn't harm anyone else. But the bitter aftertaste in my mouth still remained. Because no matter what the sisters' motives were, they had destroyed several young lives, lives that were just beginning, and nothing would change that now. On my way back from the court, I mentally promised myself that I would make every effort to prevent such tragedies. From now on, I would always remember, evil can hide behind the sweetest appearance, and I must be on guard to stop it in time because otherwise there could be many more victims.